Okay, guys, let's quiet down. Uh, we're glad to uh, bring in here John Buckles. Um, and re I know. Re Reborn Ministries. Hello? Hey, it's working. Hey. Let me get the recording up there. Good afternoon. Thank you, Charlie. It's an honor to be here. Okay. So, shall we open in prayer? Thank you, Jesus. What did, did you want that up there? Right? Did you have a presentation or was it small? It was right, but now it's what you normally would have on your computer. Can you switch it back to the presentation? Slides, yeah. Top. There you go. Hello, again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this day. Thank you for our freedom. Lord God, thank you for loving us. Lord, you knew us before the world was created. And without you, we would not be in the kingdom because no one comes to you except by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving us that much that you called us. I just pray that each and every person here is going to, to feel um, that they enjoy being in here, that they learned a lot, and uh, that they'll be mo motivated um, in the future to, uh, to give you everything they have and to expand the kingdom of God as you direct them and push back Satan. I bless everyone here, Lord God, their families. And uh, we just look forward to an exciting time of the next few hours. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so let's just pretend for a moment that everybody is in the passenger seat of your vehicle. So I want you to take your left hand and reach up over your shoulder. Everybody, please. And now pull your seatbelt down and clip it in. Because you're fixing to go for a ride. Y'all like this picture? Love this graphic. So we come alongside and partner with kingdom-minded pastors and ministry leaders who have hearts for evangelism and enhance their efforts to train, equip, and mobilize their congregations by providing the tools, training, and ministry opportunities to evangelize and minister to the lost in their surrounding neighborhoods. We provide and utilize useful tools that are used for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. With me, Jesus Christ is everything. And this ministry is minuscule. So for you, I'm hoping that if you're not there today, you'll get there. Because going into ministry, if it's about you, maybe you might want to reconsider. There's a video that was taken. Um, it took me a long time to get it all, over a year. And I'm so glad it came. And let's see if I can figure out how to play it. There it is. <laughs> now look at me. We've got these really special guys. That they're so I've never seen people that do baptisms that this they're, they're anointed. I mean, we've seen people demonically demon possessed go under the water and come out free. If you made a radical decision and I hold their hand, it's okay. Before you leave this place, I want you to get baptized tonight. Even if you've been baptized before. Some of y'all are hot. You need to get baptized anyway. But I want some radical people that got truly transformed. And say, you know what? I'm going into the water. To, I'm, I'm making a statement on 2022 that I'm coming out a new person out of this water. 
We're going to celebrate you. Amen. But hold those hands. Now, one more thing I want to tell you. Remember, we have the Hold the Line Intensive tomorrow, starting at 1 o'clock. It's going to be fire. That was my fifth time being with Sean Foyt. This one was in Miami, New Year's Eve, a year ago. And uh, we baptized about 49 people that night. And after he made that announcement, there was a whole bunch more that came. So praise God. So I don't know if you guys have ever said this before, but Isaiah had this prayer and he said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here I am, Lord. Send me. And that's me. That's my prayer. It's been my prayer for a long time. So I had, there's some echo coming through the microphone here. In 2014, I was getting a download from the Lord. And for eight months, I was typing or writing a vision. And I do events, and so everyone that I talked to didn't want anything to do with it. And, and you can see, y'all know Chris Vincent, some of you? He's here on the ground. Uh, Chris built this model for me, and uh, it took him a while to build it, but it took me eight months to envision it. And the first thing that I did was I took Legos to try to take that vision and put it into, um, to try to bring it to reality. That's my daughter um, looking at it. And then Chris built the one that uh, you see on the table below. And I'm still working toward doing this event. It was for Easter. I wanted to have a whole weekend where youth groups would come. And that was a mountain. To give you some idea of the perspective here, uh, just the the center stage was 250 feet long, built out of storage containers, and I already had a businessman that was gonna bring out his crane and build that mountain for me. I had another businessman that was gonna come and dig a trench in front, and that was gonna be the Jordan River, and I was gonna have John the Baptist started out on Friday with uh, him baptizing Jesus in the river, and then we were gonna train a dove to come over the top and land on Jesus' shoulder. But like I said, I couldn't get anybody to buy into it. So the guys that did the video mapping on, on this little model, I'm going to show it to you now. And Jesus is in this video. They didn't mean to do it. It just, Jesus just popped into the video. So I want to see if, if you see it, raise your hand. Does anybody see it? Isn't that crazy? They did not do that on purpose. And here comes Jesus out of the water. Think about that, out of the water. I wasn't in the baptism ministry at the time. Jesus comes out of the water supernaturally. There he is, bam, you see him? Isn't that cool? So because I couldn't get anybody to help me, I went to a friend of mine and I said, hey, I need your help. And uh, he's like, John, I'm having the same issue. I'm, I've been planning an event. I can't get anybody to help me. So I feel like we need to have an upper room experience. And I knew this guy very well. And I said, please don't say that to me because I knew that I would end up doing all the work and then he would come and take it over, which is exactly what happened. So none of you probably will recognize the room in the pictures except staff here. And that is the, the room that is above the office at Miracle Manor. We fasted and prayed in there for 10 days. It was Arise number one, but it wasn't called Arise at the time. It was just the upper room gathering. So because I was fasting and because I was really seeking the Lord, I, I needed more. So a few months later, we did... Oh, wrong way. We did the number two, which is another 10-day prayer lockdown in a church in Brandon. And you see some pictures. Um, we had people praying with us around the world on Zoom. And, and so that 10 days went by, and I had spent so much time at the computer 
working this that my back was really hurting. And that was the first time that I personally received a healing. A man laid his hands on me one of the nights and he prayed over my back and I felt heat coming through my back. That was my first experience with healing the sick and it was me being the recipient. So I was like, wow, this is really cool. I love this. So an artist did the artwork for me and I love that artwork, still love it today. The, the next thing that happened was I wanted help because I wanted to do a third one. So I started calling all the pastors and ministry leaders that I could that would come and we started having planning meetings to do a prayer meeting. Now how many of you guys know that you don't need to do too much planning if you're gonna do a 10 day prayer meeting, right? But it was my way of trying to get them to help me and work with me and actually pray with me. So uh, what ended up happening was the pastors and the ministry leaders that came ended up wanting to take it over and did. And so the third one looked a lot different than the first two because it's turned into a conference. So I guess my first teaching point with you guys right off the cuff is, is that if you're gonna do something, stick with the vision that God gave you. Because everybody else is gonna try to sway you to do it their way. But stand strong. If God gives you the vision, then you run with the vision and guard it, fair? So the third one, uh, we're in a planning meeting and we're two weeks out and I didn't have the money for the 24 hour worship and prayer meeting that I wanted to do the last night. And everybody was at the boardroom table was, was kind of nitpicking and, and going back and forth with each other saying, oh, we can do a better job than John. And, and uh, so I was like, okay. So the pastor who'd been there at every meeting, who hadn't said hardly a word, he says, John, can you do what you're saying you can do? Can you really get 24 pastors and 24 different worship teams to take an hour spot for 24 hours? I said, yes, I can. He said that I'm paying for it all. And all that chatter stopped it was over and so God won <laughs> and, the, and the night came and the last night came and we had 24 hours of prayer and worship we started out with 57 people and we ended up with about 800 when we wrapped it up and that had not been done in Tampa before there had been many attempts and the guys that had attempted in the past didn't want anything to do with it so I was able to, the Holy Spirit helped me to do this. And so after that, I felt like I needed to go to some people, some friends of mine that were doing an event. And I was already helping them. I was already part of the team. But I went to them and I said, what do you guys think about having a baptism at the event? And they said, well, we never thought about that before, but sounds pretty good. So sure. So I borrowed a horse trough from the feed store by myself, by, by, right by my house. It's a mile and right out a mile from my house, right? So I go in there and talk to the owner, and I'm like, hey, man, um, can I borrow your horse trough? What are you going to use it for? I'm going to go baptize some people down at uh, downtown Tampa. Okay, just bring it back. So... I guess that's another teaching point. Don't let lack of money stop you or hinder you from doing what God tells you to do or what you feel like came from God, right? Amen. So they're having their worship event. You can see him up on the stage. The man that, that uh, actually was in charge, he's the one bent over uh, getting the band ready. And um, while they were all worshiping around the stage, I was going outside the park area and going up to people saying, hey, man, what's up? Y'all ever do that? What's up? What's happening? How are you? What's shaking bacon? You ever talk to people? <laughs> to have a conversation about Jesus, what's the first thing you got to do? You got to engage somebody. You got to talk to them, right? Eight people got baptized first day out. So the second and third time, Nobody got baptized. And it's a lot of work. I mean, you see, I don't have much there. But imagine 
having a lot more than that now. But even then, it was work. So now we're at about 2,000 plus baptisms. I quit counting. So I was meeting with Pastor Phil in his office one day, and we were talking about my crazy idea about doing baptism, and Pastor Phil says, from now on, you're John the Baptist. And he goes, we bring baptism to you. And he actually wrote it down on his business card and handed me the card. I, I, I looked for the card. I couldn't find it. I wanted to, like, uh, scan it in for this. So Pastor Phil's been in on this since the beginning. He, he let me come in and use the upper room. So, so he's very much a part of what we're doing here. I'm also ordained through IOM. I don't know if y'all know that or not. So it's a real honor for me to be here. I'm so thankful to be here today. Okay, so do, do you guys listen to every word that your pastor says when he's preaching? Don't answer that. <laughs> well, on December the 27th, on 2015, pastor was preaching, and I'm having a conversation with God. And I'm like, Lord, I'm out there sharing you with people every day, but I want to up my game. I wonder what that's going to look like. So I'm having this conversation and I said, what if I talk to seven people a day? And I thought, don't be stupid, John. You're not going to talk to seven people a day. So how about two? John, you're doing that. So then I thought, I can uncomfortably talk to three people a day. I'll push it. Multiply that out, right? So December 27th is not January 1st. Have you ever made a New Year's resolution and broke it? Like if you make it a week out, you don't even remember on January 1st. So what I decided to do was I'm going to start today. Okay? So I did. And you can see December 2016. That's the calendar notebook with the names of the people that I talked to. But what's interesting is the photograph that's on top of that, you'll see the day 14. That was August the 14th. And you can see there where it says 1,000 plus 1. That was, um, gosh, 900, I don't know how many days exactly that was. But um, I said, well, I've already hit my goal of 1,000 because that was my hard goal was 1,000 people. I've already done that, so stop. No. It's a lifestyle now. If you do something more than 30 days, it becomes a lifestyle for yourself. Everybody know that? Yeah. Okay. So now it's a lifestyle, so I'm going to keep going and see where this takes me. So I'm already at 1,000. It's August 14th, and I'm going to keep rolling. So I'm going to let you see what the, what the uh, year looked like if you graph it out by the week. Wow. As you can see, there was some inconsistency from week to week, right? But the bottom line is, that I made it through the year, and I ended up with 1,422 people that I shared Jesus with that year. The average person, the average person that's out there evangelizing, they want to get that soul count. Oh, I led 13 people to the Lord yesterday. Great. Here's their cards. Try calling them. That's not my thing. When I talk to people about Jesus, I want them to experience the love of Jesus Christ. I want to point them to Jesus. Some sow, some reap. They both rejoice together. Y'all have heard that, right? So, okay, I finished the year. What do I do now? Keep going. So for three years, my original goal was three a day. So for three years, you could see it kind of decreased in 2017 and 2018. But that's okay because I kept going. And... At the end of the three years, when I divided it all out, it came just short of three a day. Has this got anything to do with baptism? Yes. With me, it's all-inclusive. So I'm just showing you how this started out. So that's what it looked like monthly for three years. And again, you see how it's up and down? But here's the thing, you guys. If Jesus gives you an assignment and he's in it, then everything's supposed to work for you. <laughs> no. 
But you have to fight through. Because not only are angels assigned to you when you're born, but so are the little demonites, the little, the little whatever they are that, that follow you around, try to mess with your life. But you know they have no authority over you, so just kick them to the curb and keep going. So what about artwork? You know, if you keep going in ministry, things happen. And I just love this. Baptism in Hebrew. Baptism by fire and water. So what about baptism? Okay, three years, first three years out of the gate, 93 baptisms. We did them, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. No miracles. But I kept going and I kept praying. I kept asking God, come on, I see other people doing it. I'm looking on Facebook. I'm looking on YouTube. I see other people that are doing baptisms and people are getting healed. People are getting set free. Nothing's happening here. Why? Well, just keep praying. Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop. So in 2019, we're, we're, we're headed out. People are calling us. We're moving. I don't call people up and say, hey, man, can I come do baptism for you? I'll wait on the phone call or people calling me. So that's what 2019 looked like, 74 baptisms with a regional type thing going on. 2020 gets a little bit more expanded. Okay? 511 baptisms. What? Yeah, it happened. 2021. Oh, I know. I'm back up here. Y'all see Washington, D.C. on there? We, we got invited to go to Washington, D.C., and we were baptizing on the mall. Yep, and it was 40 degrees. Everybody's wearing their heavy jackets, and it was raining off and on. Still got 100 baptisms. Isn't that cool? 2021, more locations and 528 baptisms. It's harvest time, y'all. So, thank you. So, people are telling me, John, you need to duplicate yourself. Well, I think I'm just doing fine. I don't need to duplicate myself. So people are starting to prophesy over me. John, duplicate yourself. Uh, okay. <laughs> so what could that look like? Starts with, then you get two. And then you get blessed with others. And, and after so many people come and go, and let you down. They tell you, man, I'm with you forever. I'm your best bud. Two weeks later, where'd they go? But you keep going. And then God sends one. That's what Pastor Phil told me three years ago when things were not looking good for me. He said, John, I'm going to tell you what I tell other people in your position. I was like, what's that? You know, I'm always looking for Pastor Phil to speak into my life. He goes, just keep going. He said, he said, Sooner or later, somebody's going to show up, and they'll stay with you for life. And then, boom, it starts from there. But if you're not willing to go through the tough times and the lean times, you'll never make it to where God starts really using you. Is anybody okay with this so far? Three of you. Perfect. God designed us to be like heat-seeking missiles or guided missiles. If we have vision, we're going to move toward that vision. That's why speaking life is so important. Speak life, speak death. But when you have a vision and you're working toward it, you all understand what I'm saying? Then you start moving in that direction. Okay. So one of my visions was the logo. You can barely see it, but there's a man baptizing a woman in that logo. And I sent that out to some people, and look what came back. A beautiful logo. I just love this one. I just got this like a week or two ago. I love it. So cool. All right. Reborn Ministries, who are we? We're evangelists. We spread the gospel. We travel from one place to another. We preach the word of God, proclaiming and communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? We persuade people to repent of their sins and ask God for forgiveness. Shh, shh, people don't repent anymore. Don't do that. 
Well, if we're going to work with them, they're going to be repenting of their sins or Amen. they can just move on. Because that's what John the Baptist did. And by the way, I'm John the Baptist too, but it's spelled different, J-O-N. <laughs> Our ministry team preaches without apology. We're God's ambassadors, and we're on a mission to point as many people as we can to Jesus and prepare the way for his return. That's who we are. Baptism is the biggest tool in our toolbox, but we're still evangelists. So you guys want to go into ministry or you wouldn't be here? You want to be like Jesus? You want to pray like Jesus? Jesus would pray all night. It takes more than three or four minute prayer a day to propel you into that new dimension. So be like Jesus and pray like he did. Jesus, he devoted himself to prayer, and prayer was at the heart of his ministry. Jesus went out to the mountain and prayed all night long. Think he just did it once? No. He, he sent the multitudes away. What did he do? Goes up to the mountain and he prays. How about, have y'all ever heard about a prayer closet? If you don't have one, get one. Set aside somewhere, inside, outside. Get in your prayer closet and pray. Pray like Jesus. Out of the throne room flows rivers of living water. From the beginning, the God of miracles has been moving supernaturally in and out of the waters. God saved mankind from Satan's plan to disrupt the DNA through the flood waters. Eight souls and the animals that God picked to come with him that were untarnished. God saved the Israelites through the waters of the Red Sea. Right? Is that a miracle? Oh, yeah. God saved Hagar and Ishmael by providing them with an oasis to drink water from when they were at the point of death, in the middle of nowhere. She cries out to God, he answered. What about Moses? Got rescued out of the water. God brought life to the waters of Marah. Remember the bitter waters? I say remember, I'm hoping all you guys know your word. You know, even in disobedience, even when, when it's a flesh thing, and this is important, I hope y'all hear me on this, even if it's, it's, a, it's a flesh thing, God can still work with you. I know I worked in the flesh for a long time in this ministry. <laughs> he still shows up. Elisha demonstrated God's power to his prodigy by separating the Jordan waters and walking across on dry land. And then Elisha said, hey, will you give me a double anointing? Yeah, if you're still around when God takes me, I will. So he's coming back. His, his, his tutor, his master, is gone. So he's walking back, and he comes to the same river. And this time there's a posse on the other side of young prophets waiting on him. So he shows off, walks across dry land, proving that he has now got the anointing of Elisha. Isn't that cool? What about the floating axe head? You remember that? They're building a house for the prophet. Axe head breaks off, floats into the water. And he goes, mm, I, I borrowed that. I borrowed that. What happened? Floated it. Didn't have to pay for it. That is so cool. What about Nahum? That's a cool story. It's an awesome story. I love it. Where do you get, where do you get healed? In the water. Okay, okay. You should know this. You might not. But there's three significant things that happened during Jesus' baptism in the water. First of all, we all know that the Holy Spirit came down. What's that? I don't know. It looks like a dove in the form of a dove. It wasn't a dove. It was, looked like a dove. Second thing is God spoke. That's my boy right there. Y'all listen to him. I love him. And, and he, just listen to what he has to say because you're going to love him. Then... Here's the thing that people that get saved, that get baptized, are not usually told. You're going to be tested. Jesus got sent into the desert to be tested, to prove himself, to overcome 
what Adam failed to do. Right? Y'all understand what I mean? So when you lead somebody to the Lord, let them know that the other side's not happy. And they're not just going to walk away and forget about it. They're going to come at you. So you need to prepare them and let them know in advance that when you're sharing your faith as a teacher in a high school, the dark side, the demonic side is going to give everything they have to take you out. But you persevere. You persevere knowing that the Lord is so proud of you. Uh, but, Master, I don't have any tax money. Oh, that's cool. Just go throw a hook in the water. See what happens. Bam! <laughs> Peter, he got his tax money, didn't he? Oh, yeah, Jesus in the boat. Speaks to the storm. What happens? It's gone. And, and, and everybody puts down Peter all the time. But even if it was just for a moment, that man walked on water. He's a hero of mine. <laughs> okay, that wasn't supposed to happen. Let me come back up. What about the, the pool of Bethesda? Okay. An angel would come down and he'd stir the water with healing and the first one in got healed. Y'all remember that because it's important to what we're going to be talking about as we move forward. Jesus didn't say, ah, no angel's going to do that because there was an angel doing that. But this man couldn't get to the water. So Jesus asked him, hey, you want to get healed? Well, I don't know. Uh, I can't get to the water. Well, I'm a healer. <laughs> Sometimes people will ask us if we want to get healed, but we don't really want to. Why? People that I pray healing for, guess what the first thing they say to me if they don't get healed? The first thing that usually comes out of their mouth is, all right, I'll be seeing the doctor on Monday. Well, that's why you didn't get healed. Because you're putting your faith in the doctor and not in Jesus Christ. And then, and then, as far as I know, in, in Old Testament, it's not recorded that anyone was translated. But it happened in the water. Another miracle in the water. When Philip baptized the eunuch, the eunuch came up and he was so happy. Well, where's that guy that baptized me? He gone. He was an acetose preaching the gospel there. God translated him out of the water and sent him somewhere else. And that should be exciting for everybody here. Because when you, in the days that are coming, in the days that are coming, get ready. We're going to need all the power that the Holy Spirit has to give us. Amen. What about baptism? That's why I'm here, right? Talk about baptism. Okay. See, the world's telling you it's not essential. I'm standing here telling you that it is. It is essential. And there's much in the Word about water, immersion, baptism. Okay? Baptize. It's an untranslated word. Brought into the English language without translation. Weird, huh? Okay. So they took the A out of the word baptisma and made it baptism. Well, the A is alpha. Y'all tracking with me here? So the final O was dropped on batizo, and that was the omega. Who's the alpha and the omega? And they removed the alpha and the omega out of the word probably didn't know that it was going to be removed out of the necessity of being a Christian and demeaned. Y'all understand? Y'all seeing what I'm saying? Baptismo consisting of the process of immersion, submersion, and immersion for a religious purpose. That's what it's become, religious. It's not intended to be that way. It's used 112 times in the New Testament. Okay, what about dipping a fabric into the dye? When we go under the water, we should come out dyed. 
with the blood of Jesus Christ. What about when you go into the water, you're being purified? Jesus led the way. He was baptized. He had his disciples do baptisms. He commanded believers to be baptized. It lays the foundation upon our faith. And I see I've already said this, but it's repetition. When we're learning, it's okay to have repetition, right? So the three supernatural things that happen with Jesus are he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was affirmed, and he was led into the wilderness to be what? Tested. That's right. God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which eight souls were saved through the water. Figuratively, this is like baptism, which also saves us now. It's not the washing away of dirt, but it's a response of God or to God from a good conscience through the resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. Peter wrote that God saved Noah and his family through the flood waters. He compares God saving Noah's family through the flood waters to believers being saved in the baptismal waters. Peter actually says that. Baptism saves us. Baptism saves us now. I think y'all got that message. You may not believe it, but I've conveyed the message on what I believe. <laughs> and by the end of this, hopefully you will believe it. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're slaves or free, and we've all made, been made to drink of one spirit. And God puts a new heart and a new spirit inside of us. He takes away our stony hearts and gives us a new heart of flesh. He puts his spirit within us and he causes us to walk in his statues and we will keep his judgments and do them. Now, there's a word I want you to think about, supernatural. Is any of that natural? Can we take our heart, take it out and get a new heart? Can we do that? Is it symbolic? Baptism is a response to God from a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Kind of sounds like that's the name above all names. It's possible that this supernatural heart exchange happens during water baptism. That's just my perspective. You got your own. Peter asked, can anyone forbid water for baptizing these who have received the Holy Spirit as we have? So he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Peter linked the infilling of the Holy Spirit with immediate water baptism. Don't come back in three weeks or three months. Let's get it done. Ananias, who was probably scared to death to go see Paul because of what Paul was doing at that time, I'm sure he was. He told Paul that God had anointed him to be his witness to all men of what he saw and heard. And then Ananias said, Now why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins and call on the name of the Lord. So Ananias links Paul's commissioning into the ministry with water baptism. Y'all still with me? Yes. Yes. Most eyes still on me or on the screen. I'm doing okay. The washing away of our sins during baptism, symbolic or real? It's supernatural. You're not supposed to understand it. It's above our pay grade. So by going down the road of saying some gifts are not needed today, why don't we say baptism isn't necessary for salvation too? Let's just go there. You're all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many as you has been baptized by the Holy Spirit, you've put on Christ. That's supernatural too. You can't put on Christ. That's supernatural. You can't even really get your mind around that. I mean, maybe you can, but I can't. We're all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized in water have put on Christ. Jesus said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Y'all see Charlie and Teresa in that picture? 
Oh, my goodness. What happened? So y'all haven't even been seeing the pictures? How about that picture? Do you see that? You see that? Now do you see Charlie and Teresa? Hi, Teresa. Hi, Charlie. Love you guys. This is the day after the event, by the way. Everybody's gone. The field is being cleaned. We're baptizing a brother and sister. If baptism of the Holy Spirit is real and essential and water baptism is only ceremonial, then why does Jesus command us to be baptized in water? You're all sons of God by faith. For as many of you has been, who has been baptized into Christ has put on Christ. I have not been getting much sleep. My words don't usually slur. So please forgive me. Just overlook that, okay? Please. Thank you. There's an antitype that saves us. And I think that somehow the, uh, I'm new at PowerPoint, so it's automatically changing slides on me again after I turned it off twice. So here's where I'm supposed to be. There's an, there's an antitype which saves us now, baptism. And it's for the resurrection of Jesus Christ who's going into heaven. It's at the right hand of God, angels and authorities, powers subject to him. Okay? Antitype. What does that mean? A person or thing that represents the opposite of someone or something else, or it could mean something that is represented by a symbol. So Paul says that, but was it Paul or Peter? One of them said that. And, and so then you look at any type. It says that we're saved through baptism. So it's almost in the same sentence. So you can go with one or the other. You can say, oh, it's a symbol, or you can say, that it saves us. I'm going to go with the latter. The baptism illustrates Christ's death, burial, resurrection, but water baptism is much more than a simple explanation. Explification. <laughs> Somebody pronounce that for me, please. Thank you. A symbolization characterized by the, this is driving me nuts. Okay. I don't know how to fix it either. Okay, so I just have to go faster, I guess. Y'all get that? Praise the Lord. So should we walk in the newness of life? Yes, we should. Is it possible that Paul's comparison between our baptism and Christ's death, burial, resurrection is supernatural and not symbolic? Okay, I don't know how to stop this thing from going. When Nicodemus and Jesus was talking, Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be born again. But the problem with that was is that in the Jewish culture, uh, the Jews had to go through circumcision and through water immersion, and then they would be born again. So he's like, well, how can I be, um, how can I be born again if I'm already a Jew? Basically is what he was asking Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is like, one has to be born of water and the Spirit, or he can't enter the kingdom of God. So why would Jesus point out the obvious? Because people say, oh, it's the amb ambionic sac. Okay, well, why would Jesus point out the obvious? We're all born in water. Why would Jesus say something like that? We're sons and heirs through baptism. We're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for as many of you has been baptized or saved. Can I take a break for a second and fix this? I hope I can come back to the right slide. Okay. So y'all are my witnesses this time. It says use timing. I'm turning it off again, and I'm saving it. You know how to do this, Charlie? Yeah, you're doing it. Okay, well, I've already done it three times. So it just keeps wanting to come back. This is what happens when you try to go faster than it's able to go. Y'all see where it says not responding? Charlie fixes everything.
It wasn't connected when I started. That's right where I am. I know. Click on that one. See what happens. Why? Click on this one. No, no, no. Current slide. No. He's hard headed sometimes. He went to where I didn't want it to go. No, I wanted to go down to the presenter mode so I could see the whole thing in front of me. It's easier. Oh, okay. Okay. Hold on. This is how we are when we're doing ministry together. <laughs> oh, I love him, though. He's amazing. Yeah, he is. Okay, we'll roll. Yeah, just hit that and you got it. Don't hit that one. Thank you. I think we already did these slides. Who's that? Hearing and believing the gospel is a prerequisite for being baptized. Jesus commands us to be baptized. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, repetition. When we get, when we get through this, you guys are going to have some scriptures that are just going to be bouncing around in your head. Okay. Today, one of the most widely practiced uses of the mikvah is the pre-wedding preparation of the bride and groom. It's a way of becoming ritually pure before the marriage. The primary purpose of the mikvah is not for physical cleansing, but to symbolize a spiritual cleansing. Now, th these are not spirit-filled Christ Christians doing this. Okay, so symbolization here. The bride is immersed as close to the wedding as possible as she awaits her beloved groom. And there is no better way of entering into a marriage than to start off being pure. Well, last Thursday, my son in the picture married Victoria, and they are both virgins. Wow. Yes! Right, Thank you, Jesus. And that was a lot of work. <laughs> Let's all wash ourselves clean and get prepared for Jesus' return. Okay. Are you guys okay still? Yeah. Had a little had a little hiccup or two? Come on, man. Hi, Laura. Woo! Okay. Mary didn't know a man. Right? Inseminated by the Holy Spirit. During childbirth, Jesus broke through her hymen, causing Jesus to pass through Mary's blood. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Christy, my wife. She's been doing a lot of research on baptism. The pain and agony that she must have experienced in her hymen was ripped open, and the blood flowed through her with the water, and she had to have been in some serious pain. Jesus was born into purity, covered in the blood and in the water during his delivery. No one had ever experienced this type of delivery, and no one ever will. Before Jesus, every man born a Jew had to be circumcised on the eighth day, placing the seal of God on them through the shedding of blood. An ancient Jewish term was born again. A man wanting to become Jewish must fulfill the two requirements, circumcision and water baptism. The Talmud states, after immersion, he comes up out of the water, deemed an Israelite in all aspects. Even they thought it was supernatural. There's a complete identity change. Gentle converts going into the mikvah waters leave behind their pagan ways, symbolically dying to their old life, coming out of the water as a newborn child, an entirely new identity. In essence, reborn. So cool. Judaism regards the mikvah as a symbolic expression of rebirth. Mikvah represents the mother's womb, which in Hebrew is called rechem. The root word is rama. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Immersing fully into the waters of mikvah is like re entering the womb, the place of mercy, a rebirthing experience like becoming a child again through God's creative power. 
Jesus said, you got to be born again. Could it be that we've missed the true meaning of being born again? Jews would have understood that what Jesus meant when he said you got to be born again. When you go into the waters of mikvah, you die. When I baptize people, I say, die well. Immersion in mikvah also represents death and resurrection. A person under, underwater enters a death-like state, like a person descending into a grave. When he comes up out of the water, he comes back to life, a brand new creature, a brand new identity. The Talmud, one who has been converted, immersed, is like a newly born child. The term born again is a Jewish term. In the story, Nicodemus looked at what Jesus was saying from the Jewish vantage point. I know I've already said this. He asked Jesus how a man could convert to Judaism if he was already Jewish. Jesus responded with, the man must be born of water and the spirit. And then Jesus explained to him, hey, you see the wind? Uh, no. Right. But you see what the wind does. It blows things around. Right. You hear it. You feel it. But you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. Kind of like the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus was saying you must get into the womb of mercy, the mikvah of rebirth, the, the womb, the grave. Okay, now the fun part for me, because I deal with this all the time. Doctrines of men. Is baptism essential to salvation? Most pastors and evangelists believe and teach that baptism is not necessary for salvation. The Christian worldview contends that water baptism is unessential to a person's salvation. Merriam-Webster lines up with that view. It's a Christian sacrament marked by a ritual, okay, in the Christian community. So they're confirming it, what they say. And I hear this all the time. Baptism doesn't make you a believer. It shows that you already believe. Baptism does not save you. Only your faith in Christ does that. Baptism is like a wedding ring. It's the outward symbol of the commitment that you make in your heart. When you were baptized, you probably heard this because it's been going around for a while. Okay? The sinner's prayer. Can Y'all got your Bibles? Can somebody show me where that is, please? What? No one's looking? Why not? It's not in there. <laughs> Baptism doesn't make you a believer. So true, it doesn't. Believe first, then get baptized. <laughs> Baptism doesn't save you. Only your faith in Christ does that. False. Jesus says, believe and be baptized. And uh, he's God. So we're going to go with what he says. Baptism is an outward symbol of the commitment you make in your heart. Not. Baptism is totally supernatural. Hallelujah. Baptism's like a wedding ring. Y'all heard that? Well, you will if you're around long enough. <laughs> you won't find this comparison in the Bible anywhere. Um, I started going to a new church recently. And they were baptized on the first day I was there. So me just being naturally curious, my wife says I'm nosy. I went over to the baptism tank and hung out and just listened. And everything I just said, he said. Okay? Then I took him to Miami to, to baptize with us on New Year's Eve. And he saw the power of God. He saw the healings. He saw demons coming out of people. He don't say that anymore. Theology in a verse. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right? End all. Right there. You're saved. No baptism necessary. Inclusion. Go into the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Right? Who said that? Okay, so let's change it a little bit. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes will be saved. Now, who wants to remove Jesus' words? Nobody raising their hand. Smart. <laughs> Everybody agrees with Jesus' commandment to go into all the world to preach the gospel. If we believe and act on the first part, why do we disregard the second part of the same verse? Jesus said them both in the same sentence. 
Upon your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptizing, saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is a universal standard verbiage used almost everywhere in the body of Christ internationally now. Okay? We pray in Jesus' name. We heal the sick in Jesus' name. We cast out demons in Jesus' name. Why don't we baptize in Jesus' name? It's not recorded anywhere in the Bible where Jesus' disciples used the phrase, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you want to look it up, you're going to find out I'm telling the truth. There's nine accounts of baptism in the New Testament in Acts. And none of them say that. Four say in the name of Jesus Christ, one says in the name of the Lord, and the other four just, we baptize you. Okay? But it's the same people doing the baptism. Does that make sense? And my daughter, Purdy, she just turned 18. And I promise you, this was in Washington, D.C. You can just see it all over. The Lord touched her in the water. Oh, here's another thing. Where in the Bible does it say they laid people backwards to baptize them? Or it doesn't, does it? it does, it's not in there. Tradition, doctrines of men. That's just what he did, so I'm going to do what he did, right? 2,100 years ago. Everybody says 2,000 years ago or 2,100 now, right? After 400 years of prophetic silence, it was finally broken by John the Baptist. And he preached a strong message of repentance. Naturally, he was rejected by the religious leaders of his day, and John turned many to the Lord and baptized those who repented of their sins. Isn't it interesting that it says, he baptized those who repented. Yes, I have refused to baptize people in events if they wouldn't repent. And one guy, he's like, I'm going to go talk to the organizer. I said, she's standing right there. And I'll see him. He's like, blah, 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 blah. And she's just smiling. And she says, it's what he says. <laughs> John came baptizing with water under repentance, but he proclaimed to everyone that Jesus was mightier than he and that Jesus would baptize with fire and the Holy Spirit. John and Sarah came baptizing with water under repentance. They proclaimed to everyone that Jesus is mightier than they, that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Y'all see Sarah in that picture? Yeah. <laughs> John went before Jesus in the spirit of Elijah and turned the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and he made ready the way of Jesus Christ. We're ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit and turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and making preparation again for Jesus Christ to come. That's what we do. Everybody in that area came out from Jerusalem, from Judea, everywhere, and they were all baptized by him confessing their sins. John said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, The one on whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and borne witness that he is the Son of God. Amen. One of the things that made John the Baptist unusual is he came with somebody's spirit. Does anybody know whose spirit he came with? Elijah. Who? Elijah. Huh. Good for you guys. When John's disciples complained that Jesus was baptizing everyone, John answered, Jesus has got to increase. I got to decrease. Is that how we are? Is that how you are? Because people that are in a school like this, you know, you're like, man, I'm going to get into ministry. I'm going to tear it up. And I hope you all do. I hope you make such a difference in this world. But you want to be effective? Learn what it means to die to yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus. Amen. That's when you're going to become super effective in ministry. 
Jesus said that there has never been one risen greater than John the Baptist. He fulfilled his, he, 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 he fulfilled his mission, right? Did he stop once he baptized Jesus? No, he didn't know what to do, so he kept going. But his, he came for that purpose, to introduce Jesus. And then he was done. So God stopped him, threw him in prison. And that was where John spent the rest of his life. But even though he was there, he got to minister to the king, and I'm sure a lot of others, while he was in there. Right? The king visited him often. Looks forward to hearing what John had to say. He's kind of hoping he'd give him some money to get out of there. So you know that John the Baptist had an impact on not only the king, but everybody else. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Did y'all did y'all hear in the name of? Did you see that or hear that? Whoa. Jesus commands believers to bring unbelievers to church and let the pastor do all the work as the evangelist and get them saved and baptized. Not Jesus tells us to go. Does he tell us to go? Yes. And why are y'all sitting here? <laughs> That's right, you still got your seatbelt on. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. So I showed you the numbers of me sharing the gospel for those three years. Well, here's one of them. In Atlanta, Georgia, I was working for a construction company selling the commercial elevators that go up and down the sides of the building during construction. And this man was fortunate enough to run into me. Because when we finished that conversation, you know what he knew? He knew that Jesus loved him. He knew that Jesus loved him. And I gave him a Gospel of John. Doesn't look like this one because they have hundreds of different co covers. Are y'all are y'all familiar with these? the Gospel of John. It's printed by the Pocket Testament League. They're free for you. If you become a member and then you write them an email and say, hey, you know what? If you'll give me 50, I promise I'm going to give them away. Other than that, you can pay for them. Because you ask. I'm going to give you this because Jesus loves you so much. Thank you, dear. Thank and the information's in there. And with the Pocket Testament League, they're all about the Word of God. And all they want you to do is hand it to somebody. With me, that's not the way I hand them out. You know, the gospel message is on the inside. So I'm not just going to say, here, man, take this, take this right here. I'm going to talk to them about Jesus, open up the book and show them, hey, look, this is what you need to know. And if they give me the time, I'll go through it with them. If they don't, at least they know that it's in there, Right? I've given away thousands of those, thousands, all over. I've traveled a lot, and, and they come in different languages. It's so cool, because I used to keep them in my van, you know? And it's like, oh, you speak Portuguese. You're from Brazil. I'll be right back. Ta-da! It's in your language. I'm pretty motivated, in case y'all hadn't noticed. Okay. Teach new converts to observe all things that Jesus commanded us. This picture was taken uh, in November. And uh, you can see Charlie in the picture. Charlie was there. And I don't see, I see Laura. Do y'all see? I see Teresa. They're there. Cool. What do y'all think about that little setup? Pretty nice, isn't it? So what we started doing in Fort Pierce, we changed things up. Praise God. Before, they would come to the fishing hole. That's what I call our baptism station. They'd come to the fishing hole. Hey, what's up, man? You ready to get baptized? Yeah. Uh, see, see that table right there? It's got your size and scrubs. So go get changed up and come back and see me. People that, that are in events don't really want to walk around wet. So that's why I came up with that idea. And you, on, the, uh, on your left, you can see the black and white little canopy there. That's a changing room. 
So that's what I used to do. I'd, I'd have them come in, boom, send them to the dressing room, get changed, go straight to the water. In Fort Pierce, what we did was we brought them in this little area here, and we shared the gospel with them. Then we baptized them. And we saw a lot of things happen. Oh, my gosh. Woo! Uh, strange things, too, yeah. They were very strange if you've never seen them before. <laughs> and don't forget to share his love and demonstrate his power. This is part of the gospel right here. Let me, let me, let me share this with you guys. The Great Commission, right? Y'all all know what that is, right? Not in the Bible, but it's still, everybody calls it the Great Commission. It doesn't work without the Great Commandment. You've got to get that down in your heart and in your spirit first. And when you get that down, come on. It gets really good. Okay. This was taken five years ago. And a lot of people got touched. This was down in Port Charlotte. The person that's... i got to go to the next slide for that. This guy. Okay. His brother in the yellow shirt with his hand over his head like this was ministering with me, and he was, he was healing people right and left. Just it was beautiful. And he kept telling me, my brother's coming. My brother's coming. My brother's coming. He was so excited that his brother was going to come because his brother wasn't walking with the Lord. So he showed up near the very end of the event. And what his concern was, that he had already given his heart to the Lord before, but he couldn't walk it out. So he's like, well, I don't want to do it again, but I'm not going to walk it out. So I had about a 45-minute conversation with him. And I asked him, he asked me for my story, and I said, well, do you want me to sissify it or do you want it raw? He goes, I want it raw, man. So I told him my testimony, and, and he was blown away. So you can see me talking to him up in his face. What, am I, what do you think I'm talking to him about? Righteousness. What's his concern? I'm not going to walk it out. Here I am telling him, yes, you are. Yes, you are going to walk it out. And you're going to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Let's see if this works. I've learned a lot about PowerPoint in the last few weeks. <laughs> Apparently not enough. Oh! Whoa, it works. Father God, I Five thank years ago. so much for Scott that he has totally submitted his life to you today. He's humbled himself, Lord, and invited you into his heart. And he wants to know that it's real. And it is the real deal right now. And I'm so honored to be able to baptize you. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' name, you are now a new creation. Five years ago, this man's still walking it. He's letting me disciple him. He's up in Tennessee now, and uh, he calls me all the time. Does he struggle? Yeah. You know what my counsel is to somebody who struggles? Repent, get up. Get back in the game. As many times as you do that, God will always forgive you. But there's consequences. There's cause and effect of sin. Right? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, speed gospel. What would that look like? What does that mean? Well, in an event situation, you don't have that much time. You've got people, other people wanting to get baptized. When I'm, when I'm sharing the Lord with people at work, they're on the job site, eh, you don't have that much time. So I call it speed gospel. You hit the main points, but you do it quickly. So, Oh, that was cool. Creation. What are the kids told in school now? God's not real. Bible's a lie. Your parents are stupid. They don't know anything. We're the way. And you came from an amoeba that washed up on the beach billions of years ago. What do you think about that, kid? Oh, okay. My parents are stupid. I heard that part. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? They don't know. And, and in, Fort, in Fort Pierce, the, the baptisms that I just enjoyed the most 
were the three that came up that had never been in church. And they got in that baptismal water. And the Holy Spirit hit them so hard. And they were praying in tongues. And didn't know, didn't know anything about tongues. We didn't even talk to them about it. What's that? That's speaking in tongues. That means that the Holy Spirit's on you. Praise God. Okay? So after we go through the, the, uh, the creation, we're supposed to go to this slide next. Blood sacrifice. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a while, but I learned things from people. And Charlie, that's that guy up there in the booth, he pointed out to me that the first blood sacrifice happened in the Garden of Eden. I never put that together before. And then, if you think about it, when God put those fur skins on them, they might have been covered in blood. They might have been covered in blood. They were redeemed through that sacrifice. So, Because I always wonder, well, how come... God didn't like Cain's offering. Oh, well, God showed him how to do it. You know what I mean? He laid it out for him. Okay, after the blood sacrifice, and they understand what sacrifice is and what it's for, go to the man. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, we're moving fast. We're moving fast. But they're understanding. How do you know they're understanding? Because it's a two-way conversation. This is the way I do it. I'll tell them something. I go, you understand that? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, good. And we keep going. I engage. I talk to people. I make sure that they're listening. That's why I keep asking you guys. You with me? And for the most part, most of your eyes are staying on me, and you're not doing, looking at your watch and fiddling and stuff. So I'm doing okay. But this is the, the way that I am when I'm talking to people about Jesus. And then, being John the Baptist, you got to repent, bro. God loves you. He don't want anything to happen to you, but you need to repent of your sins, and you need to understand what it means to have a repentant lifestyle as a believer. Then we go to baptism. And infilling. What does infilling mean? I'm sorry. Three of you. Wow. Maybe I'm not doing as good as I thought. But then after we do that, we talk to him about living in the kingdom of God. Does that just mean righteously, holy, pursuit of doing the right things? Do y'all think that's what it is? There's much more. Jesus tells us to do stuff like heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Doesn't he tell us to do that? Yes, he does. That's living kingdom, walking in power. So then... They give the heart of the Lord, congratulations, woo-woo, accepting Jesus as your personal Savior is the best decision and the most important decision you've ever made. See, that's the way I feel every time. Your family now, you were crucified with Christ in the water. It's no longer you that's alive, it's Christ living in you. The life that you now live in the flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God who loves you and gave himself for you. Your royalty. People need to understand. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king now. You're a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. You've been grafted in. You may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. As a believer you can, as I just said, you can walk in power. You can demonstrate his power. Signs and wonders and miracles will follow those who believe. Or you could say those who say the sinner's prayer. No, those who believe. Okay? You also have to know who Jesus is. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus says that those who love me obey my commandments. Y'all ever heard that? That's where the righteousness comes in. The holiness comes in. Those who love me obey my commandments. Okay, the next thing I want to know is, do you have a Bible? I carry Bibles with me. If they don't have one, 
I would love to give them one. Then I tell them, you need to read your Bible. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that as a man of God or a woman of God, you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word is Jesus. So whenever you read your Bible, the Holy Spirit's talking to you, and He comforts you. He strengthens you. He'll guide you and give you the courage and the wisdom. He'll help you through every situation you face, as long as you keep your eyes on Him. It's very important that you find and plug into a Spirit-filled, Bible-believing church. Hey, man, do you know of any churches near you? No? Well, let me tell you something. You need to stay in church. It's important because the Bible says don't forsake getting together with each other. The assembling of, the, of, of ourselves together is a manner of some exhorting each other, right? Die to your old nature. See, this has to be explained to a new believer. Do we tell them, if you, if you give your heart to Jesus today, you're going to prosper and everything's going to go well for you and you're going to make millions of dollars if you tithe? Is that the way we talk to them? Not me. I tell them. you got, you got to put to death your members. Fornication, uncleanliness. <gasps> Did I say that? Passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Escape the wrath of God that is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked in, but now you're a child of God. Don't do that anymore. See, they need to be told that. If you're leading someone into the kingdom and pulling them out of darkness, it's not a, a two-minute thing. You even want to follow up with them if you can. Build a relationship. Get them in the Word. Take them to church. <laughs> Stay on the narrow path. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because the narrow gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. Do you find it? Okay, y'all know the scriptures where people are like, but dude, Jesus, you know, I did all these great things in your name. He's going to be like, I don't know you. Get out of here. So just because you do signs, wonders, and miracles don't mean that that's going to get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is having a pure, holy, relationship with Jesus Christ. So that on the day that you're trembling in front of him, hoping that he's going to say, well done, faithful servant, enter into my rest, he will. If he knows you. Be careful who you listen to. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're like ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. A good tree cannot bear good, uh, good fruit or bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. By your fruits you will be known. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and you're not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I'm going through these really fast, and I'm hitting you all with a lot of scriptures. I challenge each and every person here. Learn these scriptures. Learn these scriptures. If you're going to share your faith with people, you don't have to. No one's going to make you share your faith with people. Here's what happens with me. I love people. It's just in me. I just do. And when I meet somebody, I'll be like, man, this guy's so, this guy's so cool, or this woman is so awesome. I'm so glad I got to meet them today. And in my heart and in my, my eyes, love shines through. But then I get to thinking, wait, uh-oh. What if they don't know Jesus? Ooh, that's not going to work out real well for them. Hey, man, can I tell you about Jesus? See? If you don't have that love in your heart, who cares? Why bother? So what if he's going to go and burn in hell for all eternity? That's not on you. You got your fire insurance, right? Yeah, I said that. Who does the Bible say is a man after God's own heart? There's only one. Who is it? Who? That's right. It's King David. David was the, the king 
who repented more than anybody else in the Bible. I mean, it seemed like he was always running back to God going, I'm sorry, I screwed up again. Please forgive me. Yeah, he did a lot wrong. He did, he did some bad stuff. But God loves him so much because he would always run back to God. I love you, Father. I love you, Daddy. I'm so sorry I, I messed up again. Please forgive me. Help me not to do that anymore. And he had to deal with the consequences, didn't he? Build your house on the rock. Jesus says those who hear and do what I tell them, they abide by the word. It's like building their house on the rock. When the storms come, when the wind comes, the floods come, it's going to be there. But if you don't build your house on the rock, you might as well not even be home because it ain't going to be there. You know what I mean? Okay. I watched all those videos of people getting set free and delivered in the baptismal waters for a couple of years, and it wasn't happening for me. I didn't see any of it. I kept praying, and I kept asking God, let me see your power in the water. So Sean Foyt, you all know who he is? The musician. I showed the video starting out with him. Um, when he came to Orlando, I got invited to, to uh, provide the baptism. Three tanks, 50 people. Went really fast. So then they came up to me and they're like, man, we hadn't seen baptism like this. You got it dialed in. Can you, can you come to Orlando and West Palm Beach with us? When's that? Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Orlando and then Sunday, West Palm Beach. Uh, okay, I'll go. So, so I get to Orlando thousands of people in the field. It was Lake Eola, if somebody knows that, knows that park in Orlando. And uh, it was raining. Everybody was wet. So, and by the way, no one gives their heart to Jesus Christ unless the Holy Spirit brings them. Same with baptism, I found out. You could talk to somebody for an hour. Come on, man, come get baptized. They'd be like, it ain't happening. Not going to do it. But if the Holy Spirit brings them, get out of the way. Yeah. And so when we're doing these big events, we start baptizing before the music ever starts. <laughs> and we're still baptizing after it's over, and they're all packed up and gone. So here we are. It's raining in Orlando, and we start baptizing people. We didn't need hospital scrubs. We didn't even start using them until after that. But everybody's already wet. 120 people going into the water. Had three tanks. And by the way, we always anoint the tanks with oil on the front end and pray and ask God to anoint the water. So here's this young Christian girl. She's got her I Love Jesus shirt on. She gets in the water. And as soon as she sat down, she's screaming like she's on fire in pain. And I've been praying for this. I've been asking for this. I recognized it immediately. So I said, <laughs> What's the matter? You don't like that water? Why don't you come out of her? And guess what? He did. That was our first one. And then there was this little boy out in the field, and I could hear it. I could hear him. I could hear the people. And this was going on for like an hour. And finally somebody said, let's take him over to the baptismal tank. And, and Sean and them were gone. <laughs> Here they come. Drop them in the water. They're all in the water, talking to them around the tank, talking to the demon. Come out, come out, come out, come out, come out, come out. And I'm like, I just want to go home. I'm tired, you know. And I'm thinking, let that little boy out of the tank. He's screaming. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Uh -oh. I'm just over here packing, and all of a sudden he yells out, Jesus is stupid. And I went, keep that boy in the tank. <laughs> He got free. He didn't look the same. His countenance was different. He was running around smiling and happy. I was like, thank you, God, too, the first night out, too. And that's when it started. We have seen so many miracles. Demons coming out of people, common. People who hadn't been with me before, and this is going on, it gets a little freaky sometimes. <laughs> Might even run out. Ah! 
right? But it's not us, it's God. It's the Holy Spirit. He's using us and setting people free. I absolutely love it. There's power in the water, right? Just like from the beginning of creation, God hovered over the waters. There's been miracles happening in the water ever since, as long as we don't get in the way, okay? So in Jesus, we received a circumcision without hands. We put off the sins of our flesh by the circumcision of our flesh. And we're buried with him in baptism. And we're raised with him through faith and the power of God. He raised Jesus from the dead. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he's coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Is that symbolic? It's real, isn't it? We've already gone over this. Jesus coming out of the water. Holy Spirit coming upon him. A voice came out of heaven saying, You're my son. I'm well pleased with you. Do you believe that through the baptismal process, God gives us a new heart and implants a spirit within us, that he takes away our stony heart, gives us a brand new heart? Do y'all believe that yet? Yeah. Some of you? Okay. It's him that calls, it's the Holy Spirit in us that causes us to pursue righteousness. We can't do that by our own power. We're wicked by nature. It takes him. Ezekiel wrote that God will cause us to walk in his statutes and his judgments. In other words, the Holy Spirit living inside of us will give us that desire to obey him. It's God's Spirit that does inside of us. But we have to yield to him. Everybody on that same page with me there? We have to yield to his Spirit. It was proven over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's impossible to please God on our own. We can't do it. We've got to have the Holy Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, we'll walk in the Spirit. To live a consecrated, sanctified life, we must have the power beyond ourselves through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And it's only through the sanctifying blood of Jesus Christ and His power that we're able to overcome sin in our life and be holy. Should we take a break? Yeah, take your seatbelts off. Y'all take a break, please. You want to get baptized? I don't know. I'll think about it. <laughs> Come on. I can't. I, I don't do real well with sign language. <laughs> um, my grandbaby is three years old. Um, my daughter is 40 years old. My daughter said, oh, so can Evelyn get baptized today? The little one? Yes. What, do you, what is the... A little one can get baptized like that? Sure. But it's not going to mean anything to them. It's not going to give that transference of the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. It's just, it's just, if that's what she wants, a lot of times I'll baptize the little children just because they're screaming, they're hollering, they're disappointed. But even my kids got baptized when they were like seven, eight, and then when they were adults, they came back and said, okay, now I want to, I want to do it for me. Okay, so they have to, the child has to want to be baptized. Well, I mean, the parent can do it at this age. It'll make the parent feel good, but it's not going to do anything for her because she doesn't have a clue what's going on. Well, she, she, to get uh, baptized, you need to understand what's going on. That's, uh, that's age of... Um, when they, when they know, like I said, my kids were eight and, and seven and eight when they got baptized the first time, and then they came back later and said, you know, we just did it because okay. you're, you wanted us to. Yes, sir. Yeah, I hope that helps. Next slide you got, Bob, because they want to go. I know. They, they want to. Um, the good stuff's coming, too. Yeah, well, they want to start pushing them out to the pool. And Whatever you guys want to do. Yeah. So you want to talk a few minutes more and then take them out? Well, let's see what Laura wants. That's what she wants. Well, okay. 
Well, let me just can do it now or well I would like to kind of go through here but um fast can you go through it <laughs> You know, I'm here to surf, so yeah. if she says stop, I'll stop. Yeah, we're going to stop and take it out front side then. Okay. That way they can change their clothes and get out there or just go out on the clothes they got and then they can have time to change their clothes before we have to go do what we do tonight. I was going to go into heel sick. Yeah, dump. That's another email. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm so tired, man. I don't usually stutter. You know, slur. Yeah, I was sure you, yeah. That's why I upped you a little on the game. So tired. So you wouldn't hear it. So I could have I could have worked a lot less. Yeah. I told you you're good. <laughs> hey. I will always have work these thoughts for the future. Work smarter. Yeah. Longer. I hear you. I love you, Charlie. <laughs> Sure. It looks like that's what we're going to be doing next. Yes. Did anybody get anything out of this today? Oh, yes. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. Very yeah. powerful. Yeah. Trying to stay away, but I don't what, what, what? Yeah. <laughs> I ain't been speaking English. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely need to keep take that with me. There was a lot, a lot of redundancy in there. Strange things I saw when we were out there. <laughs> changes, it changes you. The presentation that I did over the weekend, yeah. over at that other church, mm -hmm. was amazing, man. We had healings. It was, it was amazing. I wish I had had that, but yeah, the PowerPoint was acting up anyway. The yeah, the PowerPoint got a little screwy on me. Turn them off. In this, in this one. Thank you. So you get in order? Well. I, I heard you, and not with this, no. I brought extra clothes. Oh, okay. sit there and watch. That's the way it usually works. Yep. Yeah, I brought it to you. I could have just, case. I, I could, well, you're going to be in the water with me. <laughs> Somebody's ready to get baptized. Laura, how are you? Yes, ma'am. Do you want us to get dressed or just get, get our things? No, I'll just put you in the, there like that, person off. 
Put your hat, keep your hat on. It'll be great. Well, I may keep my hat on, but but I'm just not, I don't care about these clothes. That, I, but my shoes I care about. <laughs> Take them off then. Yeah, I'm only kidding. Yeah. But I, I'm fine. Whatever. Sounds you like you're doing. excited. I am excited. I am too. I that is so cool. I know. I am excited. <laughs> it's a new face for me. Long day for you, John. Oh my gosh. And then you got to go do this. But you, you're used to that kind. Of I um, I could have done better without the PowerPoint. I think. Well. You got your point across, and the enemy does that when people are really rolling. It. We've seen it. When people are on a roll and they need to get across important information, the enemy interrupts. But in spirit... Okay, if you are getting baptized you, and want to change your clothes, do it now. If you're, if you're not getting baptized, then we're dismissed. Um, if you are getting baptized and don't need to change your clothes, we're going we're gonna to all head over to the swimming pool. For, okay? Just you. <laughs> Yeah, take all your things with you because you're going to be going in the majesty room tonight. Uh, so you don't want to leave your things here. At the majesty room tonight at 7. That's at 7 o'clock tonight in the majesty room. Those of you that are not getting baptized can come over and watch if you'd like to. Watch your fellow students. It would be nice if everyone would go over and at least watch those that are getting baptized. It's always kind of a blessing to everyone. <laughs> 